What does it really take to make cloud work in the enterprise world? And is the role of technologists dead or the key to making it happen? These are the questions that I asked the executive leading application strategy at Intel. I'm Charles Araujo, and this is the Transform IT Show, presented by the Intel IT Center. A short while ago, I met with Aziz Safa, Vice President and General Manager of Intel IT's Enterprise Applications and Application Strategy, to discuss his interesting views about the role of the technical leader and why architecture and integration may be the two keys that unlock the future for enterprise organizations. Aziz, welcome to the Transform IT Show. Thank you for having me. So I'm really excited about today's interview, mostly because I think for a lot of people in IT, there is this huge undercurrent. There's a lot of people that have come from a very technical background, and they're looking at this changing world, and they're kind of not sure what's going to happen. And so I'm really excited about what you're going to share with us today. But let's start with your background, because you actually have come from, not necessarily from IT, but despite having this very technical background, you've come kind of from the business side. So why don't you just give us a little bit of your journey that has led you to your current role here at Intel? So I've been in IT for two years uh, in this role. Before that, I was in manufacturing for 21 years of my career. And uh, manufacturing is an, uh, an interesting uh, environment by itself, because it's very highly intensive on transformational activities. And uh, one of the and, and my work over there was in automation, which technically is an IT work, but it's more focused around factory productivity as well as the equipment automation. And there's a lot of similarity between the two worlds, especially when it comes to data integration and the complexity that is around getting uh, new business capabilities up and running very fast. So what we'll be talking about is I will share my experience at least. Uh, not just from transforming from that role into this role, but also uh, what I see uh, is needed in the enterprise world to be able to move faster and transform the organization faster. So just be quick before we dive into everything else, I'm curious, why, why did you make the jump from factory automation into IT itself? That's interesting. You know, we, uh, in, uh, in manufacturing, we have, at least in semiconductor, we have these roadmaps from an eight inch factory to a 12 inch factory to, to larger uh, wafer scales, right? And which is the 450 millimeter next. And uh, so w w we historically work on all these activities in advance of building that factory. So for the last six or seven years, we've been working on 450 nanometer. We're running what we call today 300 millimeter factories. Before that, we spent 10 years working on the next factory, which was 300 millimeter factories. So uh, I, uh, I've spent quite a bit of uh, time doing kind of the same thing and perfecting it for the next generation. So it made sense right now to jump into the enterprise. The other thing that was uh, curious, from curiosity perspective, uh, enterprise was this big black box. It's pretty hard to understand. So I wanted to penetrate and see if I can make a difference. I'm glad it. to hear that. Even at a technology company, that IT is the big black box that people don't understand. So, well, let's get into the essence of this. This with idea of technical leadership. How do you define technical leadership today, and, and how has it maybe changed from just a few years ago? I think the term lead by itself, right, is going from point A to point B. To get to point P, you need to really figure out how, no other way, right? It's just looking at a dictionary in, in, in basic terms. Uh, technical leadership is important because if you're trying to draw a roadmap uh, for IT with all the transformational activities happening in the industry today, you at least have to have a vision uh, that you want to go to and a way to rally the team around that vision to get them there. So part of the vision is the business values that you can get from that transformation, but there's the other piece behind it, is how you build the roads and the infrastructure to get there. Without, being, uh, with, without seeing uh, that clarity on the roads and what type of resources you need in place to make sure you're, that your building of the infrastructure is complete, you will have difficulties around the road. I mean, I think it's interesting because there's a rising chorus of 
the fact that IT is becoming less technical, I'm probably you know, as guilty, if not more guilty, than a lot of people. I spend a lot of time writing about that. But I mean, the case you're kind of making is that there's still a very vital need for this idea of technical leadership, of having that technical base. Uh, to lead, you have to have a mix of both, right? You have to know the technical base. And over time, like even my case, I, I'm not hands-on on everything anymore, right? But at least I can relate uh, new technologies to old and see the transformation happening. And I, I, I use this uh, the term with uh, some of my folks, too, as we work. If you're trying to build a building, you're not just going to go get Joe uh, you know, from a bakery, as an example, and give him the, the project to go build a building for you. You have to have uh, somebody that do, does the architecture, spend a lot of time on the architecture. Architecture by itself is a requirement, right? By the time you have the first uh, blueprint, you spend back and forth between the architect and the person building the house just to refine it and make it fit within a cost target as well as how you're going to make it uh, work for you. And then you go bid this to what to somebody who, uh, a general builder, who has done this before because you want the best, more efficient way to, to build that house or that building, right? It is not we just find somebody and we give them that role because they were good sales or good. So you have to, somehow to have a blend of some technical know-how, some expertise, how to bring the right people together and make sure that as you build that building, it's coming together per spec because. No, I think it's interesting because the, and, and I actually do, I mean, we'll, we're gonna talk about architecture here in a little bit, but I, I have this sometimes love-hate relationship, but mostly because of how it's been approached. But I think it's interesting because I think one of the dynamics that's occurring is that we have this divide that's happening, I think. On the one hand, to the public, technology is becoming simpler and simpler and simpler, right? Yes. Becoming more ingrained, more intuitive, and yet, as you know, behind the scenes, it's actually becoming much, much more complex. complex. And, and that's creating this, I think, this really interesting paradigm. And I think it's putting, I mean, to me, the stakes are just getting so huge. And so how does that, I mean, how do you see that playing out? And, and again, does that shift the, the need or the role or the perspective that a technical leader needs to have? Yeah, so I, let, let's talk about it from an enterprise perspective, OK? Most enterprise systems today that you're looking at were 20 years old or so, right? Including some of our factory systems. The challenge moving ahead is, is how do you take that legacy environment and adopt it to where the new world is going from a transformation perspective in the technology space and make that seamless to the users. So behind the scene, uh, the user should be able to see newer capability, more click and go, and you're uh, orchestrating all these changes. At the same time, you cannot lose data. You gotta keep security. You gotta do things very, very carefully because at a company, let's say our size, the records and the consistency of the data is very important, okay? So uh, that brings the need of how do you think differently about an approach. You don't wanna think about an enterprise transformation as silo projects or pilot. You have to be able to look at the big picture and, and bring that big pictures and pieces. And the case you're making is that you need to have a tech, you need to have those technical bona fides to be able to do that. So you need behind the scenes those very strong technical experts that are trying to figure out how to take these requirements from the users and figure out how to piecemeal it behind the scenes and make that transformation happen without stopping the business. So let's pick up on that. I know that we, when we were talking to prepare for this, you talked about that in your time in factory automation that there are kind of two major points that you kind of took from that. One is that in that world, there's no room for error. There is no shutting the factory down. Yeah. And then the second is that data and, and analytics became really the, the key driver for how the business was actually run. Right. How do you see that applying in the world of IT today? And as a technical leader, what do I need to know about that to make it make sense for me? So uh, data is very important in manufacturing, and, and historically, some of the things we did in manufacturing were very expensive to go and apply in the enterprise world. Uh, one of the changes that are happening today is, is uh, Hadoop coming out. So from a data perspective, data storage is becoming a lot cheaper. Uh, uh, servers are becoming quite a bit more cheaper than they used to be in the past, so now you can have more compute power uh, at your fingertips than what we could afford historically. Right. So now the idea is, can we take some of the learnings that we've had in the factory to improve factory performance and efficiency and adopt this into the enterprise world? So uh, from a data perspective, there's a lot of data, social data as an example. It's very expensive to go collect, but now you can dynamically collect that data in, in a Hadoop-like environment. 
uh, the demand for structured storage is not there anymore. Structured storage forces you to spend a lot of effort building that structure, creating a storage strategy, loading, etc. Now you can move into being able to adopt a, a, that data and, and store it very quickly. And uh, at the same time, there's enough open source as well as other offering that's coming from vendors that will allow you to use tools to go mine that data and find business. So I'm curious about it. something. At least in the, and, and I think it's sometimes to the outside world, we mix the worlds of the technology companies versus the enterprise IT type of people. Mm -hmm. And you're in an interesting space because you are both, right? I mean, as an organization, you're a tech company, but you're an enterprise IT organization that you're running or part running. Is that transition that you just described difficult for people in enterprise IT? Because that is, those are some fundamental shifts in the way that you look at, I mean, you know, we've done database structures in the enterprise space for the same way for a really long time. I mean, how difficult is it to make that transition? I think the first time you talk about that transition, it comes across as difficult. I think along the way, as you start laying out the foundation and showing some of the quick wins that can happen, people start adopting a lot faster. Just to give you an example, if we go 20 years ago, uh, we, we had a sensor project in the factory. And in, uh, we had 20 PCs connected to one tool to collect that sensor's data and to process 20 it. 20 PCs to one tool. To one tool. <laughs> to process that data and the storage, we can store more than a day worth of data. Okay? And, and, and so that, the technology by itself was not affordable to put it in a factory in real time. Today, uh, you can collect that census data on one PC, and you're able to really do all the analytics on the fly with the same processing power. So that's a, quite a, a shift, right, in what capabilities you, you, can, you can get. The thinking process that needs to happen is not to get stuck with the difficulties of the past, but what's possible to do moving forward. So it's opening up and thinking about possibilities, even though if they're hard to achieve, but that opens up quite a bit of venues for, for the enterprise world. Which is going to lead us to the topic that I really am interested in hearing your opinion on, and that is that when we chatted, I think there were kind of this two-sided theme that really may be the biggest theme that when we were talking before came through, and that is this idea of architecture balanced with integration. And, and when we were talking, you also talked about the fact that for IT organizations in particular, there's this massive legacy investment that they also have to cope with as part right. of that. So if we're looking forward and technical leaders are trying to figure out how to make sense of all of this, what should they be focused on and, and you know, what should they be hearing around those two sides? So I'll talk to what made me successful in this area. Uh, I think you have to have an as-is and a to-be architecture. And along the way, let's say you have a four-year roadmap or a plan, you should be able to lay out the six months incremental changes and the value that comes with it to get to that end point. Now, having said this, the end point is not static because things are changing. So every also six months, you have to revisit some of your assumptions and see if they're still valid or they need to be adjusted. If we do this right, you can actually start seeing the transformation happening in front of your eyes in the enterprise and still being able to keep up with the changes in the world. Not doing this, you're working with a black box into a new black box. <laughs> so I want to, before you go further, and, and I know there's more to talk about there, but when we were talking, that was the one point that hit home so hard because I said I have this love-hate relationship. Why do I have that? Because so many people do those roadmaps and it becomes static. It becomes this, oh, well, that's what we're doing, and it, it has the exact opposite effect. So how do you actually achieve that? I mean, again, from a mindset or from a culture standpoint, I mean, how do you actually make that a reality where we are revisiting that and it's, so that's part of the, the way to put a program in, in place. Let's say, let's take one area, right? And let's say, let's say you have a database supplier and you have applications that run around the database, that, that particular database. From one angle, you have to have a roadmap and relationship with your supplier to look at their technology roadmap and what benefits you'll get from once you apply these new technologies. The second is you have to have a capability roadmap with your customer. Here's what they, how they're, they're using your application today, but here's how they want to use it in the future. Here's some of their business challenges in the future. And just understanding the business challenges in the future allow you also to update your customer's roadmap. And from a customer perspective, things change because right, it's, it's adopt to whatever our, let's say, environment that we're operating in. 
Now, you have to take that customer roadmap that keep on changing, overlay it on your technology roadmap, and see what requirement you want to ask your vendor, as, as an example, to provide you, or what solutions they already have in place that you can take advantage from to solve that customer problem. So it's a continuous communication. What we do with vendors is we have quarterly meetings to sync at least on some changes, and we have a yearly technology review that we share uh, some of the information we need to share to make sure that we have that alignment. And how have you dealt with customers that maybe can't imagine that future, don't know, you know, because I think it's, if, if we can go ask them, it's easy if they can tell us, but isn't part of the challenge here that they don't necessarily know what the technology can do for them? The customer, so customer actually are wanting a lot more than the enterprise is delivering today, right? The demand right now is their appetite for new technology is a lot higher than what we're used to in the past. What we need to do better is set the expectation and show a roadmap that, that, that has these uh, deliverables and wins over time so that, that we can meet the, the heightened expectations these days. A lot of what the customers see today in the market is giving them a lot of new ideas of what they can do, and it's uh, it's not something that the enterprise people can think about by themselves. So it's a that it's that type of relationship, and actually that's the feedback we take it back to our suppliers, right? We have to keep that pipeline, yeah. and here's how we're really running a business because you know today if, if I come and say a customer, it's going to take me six months or a year to give you what they need. They can just go outside and get from a SaaS provider the next day, right? Exactly. And then I got an integration problem to deal with. So let's talk about integration. I know that the, that was the other side of this coin when we were talking, which I found very interesting about your, your I mean, we, we talk about integration, but I mean, your specific approach to this, I thought was a very interesting one. So talk about this, the second side of the coin. So you've got this architecture, but we also have to deal with the integration aspect of it. So this is something I learned in manufacturing, okay, from a discipline. Uh, in, in manufacturing, we have a lot of tools and tool keep changing as well, the specs and and software and the tools keep changing, and no one vendor would use other vendors' tools because it's all proprietary. And, and we need that data from the tool. So one of the things we, the industry have set as a spec for the type of data we need from the vendors, they all have to standardize against, right? So this way we get standard set. When we get a new piece of equipment, everybody's gonna spit that data from their equipment based on a standard, and it's easy for us just to load in our database and do the analysis. Uh, Coming to the enterprise, we got now as we're opening that space for more SaaS providers, right? Uh, that's going to be a, 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 the challenge. Would be is every SaaS provider has their own nomenclature, their own data structure, right? And unless we come up with a framework for the data structure and the data dictionary within the enterprise, what we'll end up doing is trying to translate one vendor nomenclature to another vendor to figure out how to make sense for us. So it's a lot easier to start from a framework that will allow us to describe the data structure that we use and the relationship of that data. And as we build this application system, what's the easiest way to integrate? My vision is that we plug and play new capabilities. So as we move into the next five or 10 years of the SaaS ecosystem, when one SaaS provider is unable to provide us what we need, we just can switch and go to the next one. And I'm just continuing the business. A new one comes up with a new capability, we just switch so obviously, I mean, I get that from why, as an enterprise, you want and even need that. But by the same token, SaaS providers are doing a lot of this stuff and creating proprietary technologies because they're trying to avoid you doing just that, right? So how do you how do you build that in a way or, or deal with them so that you get what you need? So no SaaS provider can provide all the capabilities unless you want to go with one and, and stick with it. But so we, we have a lot of offerings from different SaaS providers, right, in the environment. So our key is to create that integration backbone that will allow us to plug one SaaS provider and make it part of our data infrastructure. And, and it's not just plug in, but also to make sure it's secured, that our information are secured too, right? And we're able to deliver that data to the end users. I mean, the challenge today is I can't spend six months switching from one supplier to another supplier, and, and the user is not patient. I have to be able to plug in and give a new capability. Now, we're not there set yet, but this is the roadmap we're going on. It's an interesting perspective because I think there's a lot of talk about cloud and SaaS and there's a lot of, even talk about having a strategy, but what I hear you saying is taking a very direct active role of saying we're going to build this layer, if you will, that allows us to create these integrations that we need. Yeah, again, it's our company, it's our data, and we're responsible to make sure that that data is integrated, it's secure, and it's efficient, 
as we deliver it to the users. I can't have a third party be responsible for the data that I am responsible for delivering to the enterprise, right? We, we, there's that, that ownership that needs to come in place, and that's where we play. So let's make this a little bit more personal as we wrap this up. I'm a firm believer, as I mentioned, that for the most part, the world of IT is becoming decidedly less technical in that we're taking on these business responsibilities. But I also believe the technical space that will remain within IT will become the most critical things because they're the things that provide market differentiation and competitive value and all those things. So for the technical leaders that are following in your footsteps, what is the one piece of advice that you would offer them, the things that they should be doing right now to prepare for this future, to live up to everything that you've just described for us? I think the one, uh, the one thing I would offer is to uh, keep an open mind about possibilities of what, we can, what can be done with new technologies. I think the more if we limit ourselves, uh, we actually are limiting our users from future potential value. Um, the way the technology is evolving and at the pace that is, uh, 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 the technology is evolving, not only we have to have a framework that will allow us to adopt uh, new technologies or new capabilities faster, but we have to think what we can do different for the business. Because at, at this time, what you want to do is not just you understand your business, you understand the, the new technologies coming in, but what can you do for the business that differentiate the role of IT and adding value to that business? That is where the big plus end. IT's value comes not just from the standard back office operation, it's more about what new business values uh, we can bring to the business, and I think most CEOs are now looking for that. So if you were mentoring me, if I came to you and you took me under your wing and, and you were going to tell me the one thing I should do tomorrow to kind of be prepared for this, what would it be? It would be think possibilities. <laughs> think possibilities. All right. As these great advice, thank you very much for being on the Transform IT show. I think this is going to be a wonderful episode that people are going to get a lot out of. Okay, great. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Thank you. If you're a technologist, a technical leader, this is good news for you. Your future is bright. But only if you are willing to, as Aziz said, embrace the possibilities. Your ability to find clarity through the complexity and to help your organization craft dynamic roadmaps to the future will be a key driver of organizational success. But it demands that you balance an architectural view with a need for both high levels of integration and high levels of flexibility. As Aziz shared with us, you need to be willing to have an open mind to look at both business and technology differently and to constantly seek out those technologies and approaches that will differentiate you in the marketplace. If you limit yourself, you're limiting your customers. This is powerful and practical advice, but the question is, are you willing to embrace the mindset that's required to heed it, and what will it take to do that? Let me know what you think about these interesting ideas by using the hashtag TransformIT on Twitter or by sharing a comment here on the episode page. Also, make sure you check out the resources that both Intel and we at the IT Transformation Institute have made available for you. You can check them out at www.intel.com slash itcenter and on our website at www.transformingit.org. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Transform IT Show. I'm Charles Araujo, and together we can change the world of IT.